tried to humiliate me. You left your mark on me, but it didn't work. You burned my mind. Ah, I'll kill you. Until this moment, you have not known suffering. I've had enough of your mouth, Bruce. So now I'm gonna kill you. For all these orcs to see. Always said you were an optimist. Know what that is, mate? It's about sizing up a situation that's bloody impossible and saying, yeah, all right, I'll have a go. I'm exactly the same way. <laughs> I'm Mike DePlata, VP of Creative at Monolith Productions. In Shadow of Mordor, we introduced the Nemesis system, creating unique personal stories for every player. And in Shadow of War, we're expanding the Nemesis system enormously. Two of the new features we're most excited about are forging an army of followers and Nemesis fortresses. Our goal right now is to use the Ring of Power and recruit this Olog, Bruce the Chopper, to expand our army. Then we're going to assault a fortress controlled by one of Sauron's overlords. Reckon you're going to skewer me? Ah, that little sword's good for a tickle, maybe. But you're going to need more than that to take me down. Nice one, Ranger! This has never happened to me before. Dark Lord. Same thing, really. End results me ripping spines out, which I like to do anyway, so either way's a win. A fine addition to our army. Name's Bruce. From here on out, I will be your shadow. No one gets to you without my say-so. Don't worry about my enemies. They will all follow eventually. You want to plant your flag in uh, Mordor, you'll need to do it deep. There's a fortress nearby. They say it's ruled by a two-headed troll big as a mountain and deadly smart, which, well, I guess he'd have to be given the two heads. You take him down, you'll send a message to Sauron and get yourself some nice new digs as part of the bargain. I'm not going to do this alone. Gather your troops. We'll do. Oh, just make sure you let me pop his heads off, won't ya? We already had a few loyal followers in our army, like Boobol the Undaunted and Az Tamo Rockskull. Recruiting Bruce means we're ready to assault the fortress and overthrow the Overlord. We're expanding the open world of Mordor to highlight some lesser-known regions like Saragost and Kirith Ungol. Mordor is a massive, living, breathing world filled with orc society, tribes, wildlife, as well as stories and secrets. You cleave me in two. Any other orc would have died, but I survived. More than that, I thrived. My brothers put me back together, stronger than ever. But they didn't make me into what I am. You did. You created the machine. No! We just got ambushed by the machine. He's cheated death and tracked us across Mordor seeking vengeance. He's from one of the seven orc tribes we've added to the Nemesis system. The machine will grind you to paint! I hate big things! Cool! Finally! It's 
instead of killing the machine, we're going to dominate him so we can take advantage of his abilities alongside drakes, grounds and other beasts during the fortress assault. There are millions of ways to forge your story and conquer Mordor. I add you to my ranks! I swear my allegiance! Before we charge head first into the assault, we should plan our attack. This overlord and his war chiefs bring poison spouts to the fight, but Bruce is bringing sappers with him to counter those defenses. We've selected our followers, and now we'll start the assault. My black speech is a little rusty. Actually, I don't know a single word, which is a pain in the ass, but to hazard a guess, he said you're all gonna die horribly. Yeah, my kind of black. Well, I will handle the Overlord. You focus on the defenders. Define focus. ways to forge your story and conquer Mordor in Shadow of War. Thank you very much. We're here with Michael DePlata, creative director for Shadow of War, here to walk us through a, a live game demo. Uh, very excited about this one. I love Shadow of Mordor. Uh, tell us about what we're going to see here. Uh, yeah, so it's the sequel to Shadow of Mordor, so we've really gone to a lot of effort to kind of make this bigger and better in uh, pretty much every way. So we're here in one of the new regions of Mordor, this is in the south, it's Nern, and um, something that's new in the game is we've added these sort of epic scale, Hel Helm's Deep scale fortresses for you to conquer. And also one of our key features last time was the Nemesis system, mm -hmm. everyone had their own unique personal enemies. So we've expanded that, but we've also added new ranks to that as well. So the uh, Overlord that's in charge of the fortress, for example. So to conquer the fortress, we need to kill him. But as well as that, what we wanted to show a little bit of was the open world. So uh, we've got the fortress, but then we also have these outposts that are spread throughout the kind of the sandbox and the open world. And before you go and take on the fortress, you can go and assault the outposts to weaken them, to draw out the different war chiefs and so on. So um, Evan who's playing, he's just sort of moving through the open world. He's actually, that guy he just tackled, that's a treasure orc, so it's a new thing we've added. So killing these guys will give you money or different loot or gems to upgrade your gear with as well. So I'm noticing a, a much greater variety of weapons. Uh, in the first game, it was pretty much your sword. Yep. In this, I've, I've seen him uh, just break out like a light spear. And yeah, and he's doing that while mounted now. So uh, that spear, that's actually, it's Aegloss, which is the spear of the, one of the elf heroes that battled against Sauron in the Second Age. So Celebrimbor's reforged that. Oh, the treasure orc died, so we've dropped a gem. <laughs> um, and because our battles are so much bigger scale now, we can have, you know, hundreds of warriors in battle. Having that crowd control and that ability to have these big sweeping attacks against those guys, and also to fight while mounted using the spear, expands that. Oh, and nice. the ending of the original Shadow of Mordor uh, was sort of like a, an assault on a, yep. on a, on a keep. So it's a, it seems like you've taken that element and, and uh, let people experience it throughout the game. Yeah, so that's exactly right. We've taken it, we've expanded the scale of it, we've connected it to the Nemesis system so the forts themselves actually express the personality of the different orcs and the overlords and the different tribes that they belong to. Uh, and uh, also we've made it sort of much more integrated as part of the story. So now after you build your army, you really do get to conquer Mordor and take over these fortresses, up 
upgrade them, install your war chiefs, and then defend them against the counter attacks and Sauron trying to take yeah. them back. So it's really an entirely new layer that we've added on top of the, the previous You're, you're creating your own power hierarchy. In, in exactly, more, which yeah. is a really natural place to take the Nemesis system, which was always about these power and these hierarchies of backstabbing and rising up through the ranks. So we've added a whole additional layer to that and uh, goals around why is it that you want this power and what are you going to do with it. And you mentioned a couple times there being um, like different uh, layers to the to the hierarchy, different roles within the organization. Can you give us sort of an outline of, of, of all those? Yep. Um, one of the things I really like about Shadow of Mordor, Mordor and Shadow of War is any enemy that you meet in the world, so any random grunt has the potential, if he kills you or achieves something else, to rise all the way up to ultimately become your personal arch enemy right. and villain in the game. So we have the we have the grunts, um, who are the basic kind of troops within Mordor. Um, we've expanded those because now we have the Olog High, so these uh, warrior, these big trolls that are very effective in combat, so they add a new dimension to that. Then we have the captains, who are the next level they can be promoted with, but even within the captains, we've added a ton more variety and challenge to fighting them because they now have different advanced classes. So we have tanks who can take a lot of punishment, commanders who can inspire other guys to fight harder, assassins, beastmasters, like uh, a lot of these different classes. Then they have elemental weapons now, so fire weapons, poison weapons, cursed weapons that change that up. And then all of the different tribes have unique weapons as well. So there's a lot more meaningful variety even in just these individual fights that you're having against these or captains. Then we have the war chiefs that lead the captains and can have them as bodyguards, so you're fighting those in groups. And then we have the overlords who are the sort of ultimate boss fights. But then you can manipulate the orc society in other ways because if you dominate different enemies you can convert them to your side and then they can potentially become spies who can stab their war chief in the back or even become a spy inside the fortress. So as you're going to assault it they'll just sabotage it for you. There's uh, so much palace intrigue going on. <laughs> yeah, body, bodyguards that you can summon. So the the manipulation of the whole hierarchy. Oh, this guy, Ulrock the Strong. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, everyone, whenever I read comments on these, they're always, just shut up and stop talking while the orcs are trying to talk. But it's, he, it it's says he, it said he was a machine commander. So can you tell us about, I yep. know that there's, is it four different uh, sort of um, machine type they, classes like the the types of, the type of societies they have yeah so the orc tribes the different societies there's seven, oh, um, seven initially okay. yeah so we have the machine tribe these guys are all about industrialization so here in Nern, you know they're chopping down the trees clearing ways for factories smokestacks um, the, and, Cer the ceremon exactly yeah, yeah yeah which is a really classic theme in tolkien of kind of industry versus nature, nature yeah, as exactly. well um, feral tribe which is about the beasts and sort of taming and training or killing the monsters mm -hmm. and creatures uh, terror tribe which is about using fear and intimidation and executing their enemies and then as, so he was a machine commander so now you've got the machine tribe and those attributes and then combining that with the commander class so all of the possible classes and tribes can interact to make a you know uh, hundreds of, of different and, and getting influence in the machine tribe for instance would give you like access to more machine oriented things is that how it works so there's a couple of ways that that really affects the gameplay one um, if you put a machine commander in charge of the fortress that's going to spread their influence through the world so there's going to be more smokestacks you know in the world in those factories and then more um, concentration of opportunities and enemies and followers mm -hmm. around the, the outposts and so on. The chatter of the enemies changes, so it really you know, just changes. It's a little bit like if it was an urban open world game and you go between different suburbs or different areas, there's a different cultural yeah. uh, flavor to the city mm -hmm. and the tribes are kind of, kind of like that in how mm -hmm. they put that layer over the, over the world. And something we noticed, uh, actually, when we were talking before, there was a character named Fubar. Uh, <laughs> something we noticed when it was being shown off at the conferences is that it seems um, like a lighter tone. It seems kind of funnier than the first one, which was which was pretty serious most of the time. I think it's actually gone further in both directions. Mm -hmm. So it's more epic and it's more serious, and the stakes are higher, and the 
the um, issues of the corruption and the ring of power and the tension between Talion and Celebrimbor and the stakes of what they're doing. You know, they're behind enemy lines, raising an orc army to take on the Dark Lord. You know, what sort of journey is that going to be for them? Right. So that can get pretty dark and serious and intense and it's big epic battles. Um, and then at the other end of the continuum, it is. We do have these characters that bring levity. And humor I mean, especially and the orc society. Like they yep. seem, they seem very uh, <laughs> like they're threatening. They're big threatening monsters, but they're also like kind of goofy and they're dumb. Kind of, they're kind like, of like heads at times. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're definitely. We try. The one thing we try to mostly. There's exceptions because we want to have a big variety. But we, the the cliche we try not to fall into with them is that they're dumb. They're not you know cavemen. Like sure. They're smart. They're just. Uh, they've just really let their urges run away. With them. They're just really, <laughs> they're really enthusiastic at times. Yep. <laughs> Very enthusiastic. So I think that brings a, an element of kind of just joy and fun to the combat, and mm -hmm. well, it's almost like they're enjoying it. You know, they're they're into it. Uh, but then at another extreme, I think we've almost got a little bit of horror in there as well. Some of our our missions are sort of spookier and darker, which is something you see in Tolkien and yeah. Peter Jackson's movies. So just because the scale of the game's so much bigger, we just have to kind of broaden the palette of the different sorts of moods and stories and, and things that are happening. And you really aim for that theatrical feel this time around, especially when you are, you're about to assault the fort and you just see, and you're just, you just see your army just standing there getting ready to like rush the whole thing, the overlord just seeing, overseeing his his army of orcs. Like you really went for like the kind of whole uh, two towers, turn of the king kind yep. of big theatrical feel there. Didn't yeah, you? I mean, it's a word that gets overused, but for us, we really want this game to be epic. It's epic fantasy. So if we see Return of the King and we see, you know, Minas Tirith getting assaulted or we see Helm's Deep, uh, we really wanted to create that feeling of that epic scale, but still have it connect to what's really unique about our game, which is the Nemesis system and these unique personalities and characters and stories that only you are going to have in, in your game as well. And it's a, a huge amount of work to do that, but we're like so happy with how it's come together at the end. Yeah, I'd love to, to pick your brain about um, the, the Tolkien influence and the Jackson influence and, and how you sort of start with uh, the research of both of those influences and source material for a game like this. I think, um, yeah, that's a great question. That's a, and we put a lot of work into that. So it's obviously reading and watching the primary sources. So of course, you know, going yeah. back and rereading Lord of the Rings and rereading Highlighting Hobbit. the Cimmerillion, yeah, totally. And, <laughs> and there's a really great annotated version. And so many people have written so much about these books. You know, there's just so much academic research on, mm -hmm. on different meanings. There's guys like Tom Shippey or Janet Croft that we get to work with. So diving into that. But then also, I think it's really important to go back to the the roots and the inspiration of Tolkien himself. So to go back and look at Norse myth and to look at Beowulf and look at the uh, Kabbalah and Finnish myth and you know look mm -hmm. at the there's another writer called Michael Moorcock and he's one of the greatest fantasy writers and he was you avoid becoming a straight imitator of Tolkien by going back to the roots of what he was also reading and was inspired by so um, and then that sort of brings you into the world of, of all of these universal myths. You know, it's the hero with a thousand faces and the monomyth yeah, and course, Joseph yeah. Campbell and, and all of those. So, and then, um, so then what we're trying to do is create this epic standalone story that you can play and enjoy whether you love Lord of the Rings or not, but that is very true to the themes of what Lord of the Rings is about, which is great because those themes are also extremely universal. So Tolkien, when he was asked what it was about, it was, you know, it's about death and the search for deathlessness, which is really not saying anything except saying that it's a story <laughs> told by humans. Yeah. Because pretty much every story from his point of view is, is that what we're, uh, that's what we're driven by and to explore. So those themes, those really mythic themes, really tie so well to the Ring of Power of Talion and Celebrimbor and their story. And uh, you mentioned there's like a, 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 a tension between Talion and, and Celebrimbor and, yep. and uh, you mentioned like the stakes of what they're trying to do. Can you give us sort of a broad overview of, of uh, what it is they're trying to accomplish this time around? Yeah, so Talion, played by the amazingly excellent Troy Baker, in the first game he was very driven by revenge. We wanted a very fast, strong hook that could get you into the game and motivate you to uh, exploring Mordor and hunting these orcs. 
now with Shadow of War where we're able to create this bigger, more epic game, um, he's moved beyond that and I think he's very driven by wanting to hang on to what remains of his humanity. So in a way he's, he's less driven by revenge and more driven by altruism and wanting to help these people in, in this ithyll and wanting to defend and hang on to humanity. From his point of view it's almost post-apocalyptic. You know, it's after you've lost everything, people can put a lot into trying to hang on to what remains or, or what yeah. they're trying to hang on to and not get lost by that. And Keller Brimbor is much more driven by um, just more practical concerns of power. Yeah, it's He's, less of a revenge story this time around. Yeah. yeah, it kind of felt like that came to a, a head in the first one, but there was a, an implication that he was going to keep fighting at the end. So. Yes, but now it's growing, the scale of everything's growing and he's fighting fighting for something bigger than himself, um, whereas Keller Brimbor is just all about destroying Sauron, and ultimately, you know, we, we had Bruce, one of our Ologs, the other day put it like, Bright Lord, Dark Lord, same thing really. Yeah. The Keller Brimbor is very inspired by that idea of Galadriel when she was offered the ring by Frodo. It's pretty much, I'm very tempted to take this, but if I did, you would have a Dark Queen in place of a Dark Lord. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Keller Brimbor's uh, doesn't have that same hesitancy that Galadriel had and plus he very much believes that the new ring that he's crafted isn't corrupted by the influence of Sauron so he's like we can use this we can use the power of the enemy against him it's all gonna be good yeah and the, in the first game uh, I felt like was some, a cool narrative trick that it did was it, it it teed up the the rest of the story without contradicting anything it it, it became like a uh, a necessary part of the story, but not a, you know, even though you're working in your own universe. It became something that fit very neatly in that. Yep. So how do you sort of jump off of that into, the, into this one to, to continue the story? I think it's the same the same principle. It's hopefully you do something that stands alone as a great story and does sort of fit in. I think what we're trying to do this time, uh, to, you know, go further with that is actually make this story slot into Lord of the Rings. So you can get to the end of this story and go and read or watch Lord of the Rings and even feel like you've maybe got some more cool insight or details into some of the elements of that. So Sauron and the Nazgul and, you know, Mordor. So it actually almost can hopefully sort of add a little bit of extra icing onto, onto the enjoyment of Lord of the Rings. Awesome. So when are we uh, when are we able to play it? When, when when's it coming? It's coming out on October the tenth, so not too far Real away. Close. Now, so we're yeah. really excited. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah, those couple of months after. I mean, it was originally set to come out in August, but it's a couple more months for just polish. Uh, just a couple. Just uh, polish off some last months. Oh. Or... Cannot exaggerate how much difference that makes. Like a game of this size to be able to balance, polish, optimize. You know everything from the the frame rate to the stability to the balance um, we're really ex excited about Great. how it's turning out yeah, really, we're really looking forward to the scope to, uh, of the nemesis system it's just so resource intensive i mean i can imagine trying to <laughs> apply it to what's essentially a bigger world than, than what you established in shadow of mortar cool. and just trying to test that as well it's crazy well thank you so much for your time we're, we're definitely going to check it out in october